remain standing. Praise the name of the Lord. 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to say we are certainly sorry for the rain in the building. And uh, amen. You know, it brings a whole new meaning to the song when we sing, Let it rain, Lord. But we are due to the ice, the snow, they can't get up there with the type of material it is and fix it. We have to deal with it until we're able to access that part due to the flowing of the water, uh, the ice that's on it. They have to be able to what they call weld the rubber seam together because of the type of material. They can't do that until we can access that. And it puts us in a precarious situation. So until then, we've got to deal with this. And, uh, and what has happened is, just be seated a moment. Let me talk to you about it. You've worked all day. We have a working church. Everybody in the church works hard. And so um, what we have is we have a material that, that I think it's called TPO. That This is an acre roof. This building is one acre. And that material, the type of material it is, has compromised. Uh, come to find out, it's not the best material for up north. And the other night when we were praying for prosperity in the prayer revival, we had a di different subject every night, just felt led of the Lord. I said to myself, I don't want to get a loan to have to fix this roof. I'm praying that God is going to make a way for this roof to get fixed. Uh, there's one estimate on this roof for $325,000. That's a, that's a lot of money. I'd rather do something else. Amen. <laughs> Wouldn't you? There's so many other things that vision that we could do without that type of thing. And just so happened on that night we prayed, there was a man that was here that came to our entrepreneurship group that was a guest of someone from my brothers that had recently given his life to the Lord. He came and he, I was showing him the sanctuary and he said, I see you got a leaking roof. And uh, it certainly wasn't even this bad. And I said, yeah, he said, this is what I do for a living. And he works for one of the largest roofing contractors in West Virginia. And he's putting an estimate together. And we believe we're going to be able to do this without getting a loan. Amen. Would you thank God? <laughs> How many will pray about that with me? We're believing that. That this will all be fixed and taken care of. And so for that, we are, we are grateful. And uh, so be praying about that with us. We're waiting on an estimate to come in. And then they still wouldn't be able to start that because the type of material it is until April. So... In the meantime, we'll have to patch and uh, go through with that. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, so that's where we are. Please don't think it's negligence and we just put buckets out, you know, instead of trying to fix it. It's not, we're, we, we operate much better than that. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. It's, um, uh, I, have, I have been in these two chapters for some time. Uh, chapter 2 and chapter 15. And I do think there is some revelation here. One day I just kept going over and over and over again because I saw something in this chapter that I've never seen before. But Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of what? Of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of what? Power. So he goes on and says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And he's declaring that there's two things that can happen with a preacher you can either build a church on the wisdom of man or you can build a church on the power of God. That's what he's saying. And that this, you, you can have, there's all kinds of religions, there's all kinds of followings, followings of men. But Paul said, I haven't get you to follow me through the wisdom of me or the wisdom of man, but I've come in demonstration of something that's beyond me. That's, that's, that I gather that's not from family traditions. 
what he's saying. It's from the spirit and the power of God. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even what? The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world and to our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they knew it was gonna come out of the crucifixion, they'd have never touched him. But there was hidden wisdom of what was gonna happen, amen, when he died. Because when he died and was resurrected, it brought resurrection power to every single one of us in this building. How many know he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Oh, clap your hands and praise him. Amen. Verse, you can be seated. Verse nine says, but as it is written, what does it say? Are y'all ready? I want you to read this with me tonight. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered to the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. All of my life, I have understood this verse to mean it's talking about heaven. It's talking about the world to come. It's talking about the glory beyond this earth. All of my life, I have thought that's talking about heaven. And yes, I believe in principle we could say that. There's some things that I believe God is holding in store to reveal to us when we get to the other side. How many believe that? We talk about streets of gold, gates of pearl, walls of jasper. That's recorded in the book of Revelation. But I do, there's, I believe there's gonna be some things when we get over there that we don't know about here. Paul makes this statement. He said, I saw things that I can't tell you about. There's some things that I have found in the hidden wisdom or the hidden treasures of God. But I do believe there's some things that you can't get by just going to college or or going just, just studying philosophies of man. I believe there's some things that you can only get by being alone with God. And that's why he says these things. Eye hath not seen, ear hath, not, hath nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath, what? Prepared for them that love him. But it goes on to say, but God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his spirit. What it's saying is the common man has no clue what God's doing for his people. There's, it's not just gonna happen because you're born. But no, but when you get in the spirit of God, when you get alone with God, when you get in the word of God, He's going to reveal to you things that he preserves and reserves for his people that love him. There are secrets that are in the spirit of God. He writes on, he says, but God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Amen. I'd like to talk to you today about the spiritual eye the spiritual eye. And um, when you begin to look at, look at scripture, there's a verse that says that we walk by faith and not by sight. My dad was standing with a preacher one time. My dad had been praying. He'd had a dream about planting a church in Glen Ferris, West Virginia. And I'll never forget walking through that old schoolhouse. My dad sold the farm. He sold the house, completely self-invested, He and my mother moved in this old schoolhouse where God had showed him to start this church. Uh, We didn't have any saints yet. He was getting it fixed up, building. And I'll never forget, we were walking down the hall, wide hall of this 100-year-old schoolhouse that smelled musty, did not smell good. It was not updated. It needed a lot of work. And I'll never forget that there there was a dead rat laying in the hallway there and and there was stuff laying out there. There was nothing put together. And there was a preacher friend of my dad's that was walking down the hall, and uh, my dad was sharing with them, we're gonna have our first service here. I'm gonna build an apartment back. Our family's gonna live here. Oh, we're gonna outgrow this room. We're gonna knock the wall out and go this way. The Sunday school classroom's gonna be over here, and we're gonna fill this up with children. He was declaring the end from the beginning. As we heard 
uh, Sunday night, amen, by Brother Urshan. But what I'll never forget is the preacher from Georgia. He says to my dad, I don't see it. It would have been easy not to see because he was talking about things that he could see from his knees, that he could see from an altar. He was thinking about things that he could see that God was showing him. It was a vision. It was hidden things that God had revealed to the man that's gonna pastor there. Listen, when God saves you, you're gonna get inspirations, you're gonna get declarations, you're gonna get callings that maybe your family will make fun of you at because they can't see what you see. But amen, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you get along with him, you're gonna start seeing hope for your family. You can see hope for a community. You can see great things coming out because when you get along with God, he will open up to you his hidden mysteries. Amen. I had a dream just a few weeks ago. I was on our media fast, and I've learned every media fast always produces a spiritual eye. One of the greatest harms we do to ourselves is consuming our lives with carnal voices, carnal people. We watch ungodly people. We watch people that, that have no concept of godliness and righteousness, and they entertain us day after day, week after week. You listen to their voices, you listen to their philosophies, you're entertained by their own human spirit, and it can affect you until you become carnally minded like them. The Bible teaches that a carnal mind is enmity with God. What does that mean? It causes you not to think the way God thinks. Matter of fact, you start thinking the opposite of the way God thinks. How many know a Christian person can become the enmity with God? Your thought process can oppose what God's trying to do. Matter of fact, Paul writes it this way. He said, Demas forsook me. Why? Loving this present world. How many know this is what the Bible says? He said he forsook me. Another verse he writes, he said, I write you even weeping that those that were once with us are now the enemies of the cross. What's he saying? I'm telling you, you can't be saved and then be lost. Why? Because you consume yourself with the world and the Bible says, love not the world nor the things that are in the world. There's a system called the world. Everybody hold up two fingers. There's only two kingdoms. There's only two paths. I was talking to Sawyer last night. I said, bub, I said, there's only two ways. It's either the way of God or the way of the world. It's either the kingdom of God or the, or the kingdom of this world. And the Bible says to not love the kingdom of this world. But to love what? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And what he teaches is that the Gentiles don't think the way the church thinks. Gentiles say you gotta allot up what's best for you and if you have any time left over, then give it to the kingdom. You gotta make sure, it's like today I go to the grocery store, we're gonna get three inches of snow tomorrow. Grocery stores were jam-packed, gas stations were full. You thought they were gonna get snowed in for the winter. You know what everybody's buying today? Milk, bread, and eggs. Two dozen eggs. Somebody said, I can't believe I made it to the grocery store and there's actually food on the shelves. I mean, we're getting three inches of snow, people. But I'm with you, I was there shopping as well, getting it like everybody else. God forbid I get stuck at home for three hours and not be able to eat cinnamon toast crunch, amen. But the Gentiles wanna make sure they're taken care of. I, if I, I gotta have enough clothes, enough food, enough this, and if I have enough, then I'll give. He said, that's the way of the world. That's not the way of the church. It doesn't mean you don't store it for winter. It doesn't mean you don't store it for retirement. It doesn't mean you don't budget and plan and, and, and have a, a, a financial expectation. And the Bible has over 2,000 verses about stewardship, and we teach that. But what it's saying is you don't become dependent upon yourself. you got to learn to become, I'm going to do what God wants me to do above what I want. It's got to be God first, the kingdom first, the church first. Amen. Prayer first. What does God want? Not just opportunities and become opportunistic people, but know what is the will of God for my life. 
And what I'm preaching to you tonight is before you ever make a decision, you've got to get alone with the Lord and say, what is God saying to me for my family? What is God saying to me for this? And I'm going to tell you tonight, there are callings in that. There are hidden mysteries in that. There is a wisdom found in that. Brother Tyler, there's some things that you cannot see until you get a spiritual eye. There's some things you will not believe until you get a spiritual eye. That verse says, it goes on down and it says, the deep, everybody say, the deep things of God. And I had a dream. It was, it was before, I can't remember what day it was. It might have been, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago. I laid down and I had a dream. And I only slept for about five minutes, had 20 minutes before I had to leave and I want to lay down. You ever get tired like that? You ever get tired on Wednesday night they just think, oh, it would be good just to sleep in tonight? How many of you ever felt that way on a Wednesday? Hey, Amen. That's how I felt tonight, but I'm here, praise God. And I laid down for about five minutes about three weeks ago. When I did, I had a dream. In the dream, I was preaching a meeting. And in that meeting, I was talking about the deep things of God. And I said, when's the last time you prayed for three hours and it wasn't enough? When's the last time you were alone with God? And I said in the dream, why have we settled for shallow prayer meetings with God? Just a few minutes here and a few minutes there. What happened about seeking God for the deep things of God and knowing what God wants for our lives? And in, when I said that, I started crying. I started speaking in tongues in the conference I was preaching in the dream. Everybody started weeping and crying in the dream. There was a moving. And in my dream, I was crying and speaking in tongues. But I woke up crying and speaking in tongues. And I could hear my kids saying, yo, I hear them start chattering. Did you hear dad? He's down there sleeping. He's down there crying, speaking in tongues. And I was half awake, half asleep at that moment. And I went back to sleep for a few minutes. But it stirred me because is it possible we could settle for a shallow experience with God when there is so much more for us? I don't want to get to judgment and God said, Aaron, I've got, had so much for for you, but you settled for a Sunday morning experience. You settled for just being saved. You settled for just going through the motions. You settled for, settled for just a blessing here and there. No, I want to see everything he wants me to see. I want to experience everything he wants me to experience. Can you say amen? I believe it's what it's talking about in the book of Revelation when he said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I believe when the trumpet sounds, only certain people are gonna hear the trumpet sound. I do. I believe that when the Lord is coming, he's only gonna reveal some specific things to the people that are looking for his appearing. Can I challenge you tonight? When's the last time you thought about him coming? When's the last time you set your family down and said, we need to talk for a minute? It could be in the morning. It could be nine or noon. I don't know when it's coming, but I know that it's coming soon. There's a song they sang when I was a kid. I'm packing up. I'm getting ready to go. We got to start thinking about this because there's nothing in the book of Revelation that is keeping God from coming for his people. He could come by midnight tonight if he wants to. You know what? I want to be ready. I want to be expecting him. I want to have been alone with him. Somebody say amen. The deep things of God. He wants to reveal those. And verse 11 says, for what man knoweth, for what man knoweth the things of a man? You see that? Save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but what? But the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. When they woke up in the wilderness, when they, in the wilderness, every morning they woke up, there was bread from heaven. Every single day. They got to eat, the Bible calls it in Psalm 78, angels food. Everybody say bread from heaven. You know, there's a lot of topology between the children of Israel in the wilderness and us on our journey to the, our promise and our destiny. Do you know that every single day that you get up, there's bread from heaven waiting on you? And you know what? We, we jump over the bread from heaven, rush with our cup of, cup of coffee in our hand right to work, 
and never gather what God's laid out for us. That's right. And we miss days' opportunities because of our busy schedules. But there is a place every day that God reserves for you to be alone with him so he can show you his will for your day. Amen. Do you believe God can show us what he wants for this day? Every day not starting in prayer is a day that is regretted. When you look on in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there is something that is here that I think maybe, maybe can answer some questions. How many ever read in the scripture where Jesus appeared to Mary and she didn't know it was him after his resurrection? How many ever watched that when Jesus appeared on the road to Emmaus to, to a couple believers, but they didn't know it was him? How? How can they look at him and not know that it is him? You have to ponder this for a minute. How can he go back to the tomb and look at Mary and she not know that it is Christ? Was it because his glorified body looked so different? I've heard different opinions, but I do believe that God has given me an understanding and revelation of this because a spiritual person, everybody say spiritual, a person that is hungry for God, they have a privilege to have what? I have not seen, yet has now been what? Revealed to us by his, everybody say by his spirit. There are some things, listen, there are some people that cannot see what God is doing because they do not have a spiritual eye. I've met many, many people in the church that do not have a spiritual eye. They can't see or hear what God is trying to do. You can get a spiritual eye, how? Through fasting and prayer. Be alone with God and get a hold of the deep things of God. What was preached on Sunday comes by revelation. What we heard Sunday night, that's by revelation. God's not to be understood with the wisdom of man. He's only to be understood by the wisdom of the Spirit. Can you say amen? Is it possible to study the Scripture and not have revelation? How is that? Read the Scripture to be carnal. One man told me one time, I said, well, you would know this. You've got your, you've got your theological uh, seminary degree. You know what he told me? He said, don't think for a minute my degree has anything to do with my knowledge of God. He said, because the entire time I was in, in seminary, I was a sinner in, in deep sin. Graduated, got the degree, but his heart was somewhere else. When you are reading your Bible, it has to be a focus on the Lord. I want to please God, I want to know God, and I want to grow in God. Can somebody say amen? You can read the Bible with your heart not open. You can read the Bible and try to study it the way you do arithmetic or literature or chemistry. That's not how we read the Bible. It comes from a hungry soul. Amen. He said, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What does Simon Peter say in Matthew 16 and 13, 14, 15, and 16? What, did it, what was his response? They said, some say thou art John the Baptist from one of the prophets. And Jesus said, no, who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed are thou, Simon, our Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. I'm telling you, when somebody gets hungry to do right, Hungry to be righteous. It causes God to reveal who he is to them. To understand the Godhead, you've got to be hungry for God and he will open your eyes and let you see what somebody else cannot see on their own. And so watch this verse in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says um, in verse verse four, it talks about Jesus when he was resurrected in verse four and that he was buried and that he, what, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. After he was resurrected, Ox records that he, was, he showed himself, what, alive. After his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen to them 40 days. This records, it says, and that he was seen of Cephas, that's another word for Simon Peter, then of the 12. After that, he was seen above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain under this present. He's saying, some of them are still alive today as I'm writing, as you're receiving this letter. He said, but some are falling asleep or have died. After that, he was seen of who? 
James, then of all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me. Paul said, he was seen of me and as of one born out of due time. What is he saying? It, it appears to me, it makes sense now. Why, when those men were on the road to Emmaus, they talked with him, but could not see that it was him until afterwards. They said, was this not him for our hearts did what? Burn within us. It is possible that it lists who saw him here because some others might have seen him but not recognized him. Why? Because they did not have a spiritual eye to see what they could have seen if they were hungry for him. Amen. Is it possible right now that God wants to do something in your family and you can't see it because you're carnally minded? Is it possible that there's a call of God that's hovering over your life, but because your focus is on the wrong thing, that you can't see what God's trying to do in your family? It's amazing because when Paul was converted, he said, it's been like scales have been lifted from my eyes. I believe there are some things you can't see until you get on your knees and hunger and want the things of God. How many believe God can open your eyes, amen, and show you the things of the kingdom? Would you clap your hands and thank God for that tonight? It only makes sense because the Bible says that he appeared to them. I'm gonna ask you this question and we're not gonna stay much longer here tonight. But I believe God in the end time is looking for people that are hungry for his kingdom. They're hungry. If you will believe that God's got great things for you, what is it that attracts a preacher, attracts a prophet into your life, attracts prophecy and supernatural things? You know what it is? Hunger for it. The Bible says seek ye uh, first the kingdom of God, but it also says uh, to seek out the best gifts and want those to operate among you. When you begin to seek the things of God, God will reveal to you his truths. Can you be trusted with revelation? I want us to stand to our feet tonight. Hallelujah. You want to be saved from hell, but God, God wants you to be more than just saved from hell. He wants you to be a part of something that's so great. I was sharing with someone this morning that when he had a dream with Solomon, Solomon humbled himself before the Lord, and this is what he said. He said, Lord, I'm but a child. Everybody said, I'm but a child. He said, I'm but a child. I don't even know how to come out. I don't even know how to come in. I'm, it's been so merciful that I can sit on the throne of my father, David. He said, but I don't know. And he said, what can I do for you, Solomon? And Solomon said, I want you to give me an understanding heart. And the Bible says that because you didn't ask for riches, you didn't ask for health, you didn't ask me to destroy your enemies, I'm going to give you an understanding heart where you will be full of the wisdom from heaven. And when he did that, he understood all things. And it was there that God opened up and revealed to him hidden wisdom and the deep things of God. I feel that God is calling this church to something more than Wednesday nights and Sundays. More than just going to church and being saved. Being apostolic in the way you live. I do believe that God's looking for people in this room that he wants to reveal some hidden things that he's going to do in the end time. The Bible says before he does anything, he reveals his secrets into the prophets. Everybody say a secret place. I want to come and stand around the altar here tonight Probably not in this area. I have wept on this subject been stirred by this the deep things of God have you settled for shallow revelation the apostolic movement was birthed on pretty much the verse in Jude that says to contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints that's what it was about I want to go back I want to have what Simon Peter had the apostle Paul what did they have did you know that 
after Jesus had ascended into heaven that Jesus himself came and appeared to the apostle Paul matter of fact the Bible says he came to him Brent and he said he come and stood beside me and he appeared to me and he said "All right, here's what you're going to do next I'm going to send you on to go witness and tell your testimony to this king as well God wants to appear to us how do you think I've seen two angels deep things of God How do you think we know what God's going to do next? The deep things of God. I won't want to go to a church where there's no moving of the Spirit. Hey, man, you got to have a moving of the Spirit because you only get revelation by the Spirit of God. Hey, man, you cannot know who He is without a moving of the Spirit. I want my kids not to go just because I methodically showed them how to go to church. No, they've got to get their own revelation. They can only get that on their knees. I can impart some things, but they've got to be hungry. And Brother Brent, I want to live a life to my own children that it's salty. The Bible says you're the salt and light. You know, when you you ever eat too much salt, you're going to get thirsty. I want my life to be salty that my children want a relationship with God. As a pastor, I want to be salty that you want a relationship with God. Amen. He told, he told them in Scripture, he said, he said, when I speak to my prophets, he said, I speak to them in dreams and visions. How many like to have a dream from the Lord? How many like God to speak to you in visions? Talk to a pastor friend of mine who's done many extended fast. I've done extended fast, and when I'm on extended fast, you think I'd never want to do this again. Anybody ever been there? Turn around and come off of the fast. and They say, no, you crave to do it again because what you get out of it is the deep things of God. Your problem isn't the devil. Your problem is your flesh. And if we could ever get away from how we see, in the Garden of Eden, it was, a, it was, it was just dependence upon God until they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what happened to them? They got the wisdom of this world. You know what that is? Two plus two equals four. We teach it just down the hall. We teach algebra and chemistry. We got a science lab we're putting in, dissecting frogs and talking about logical things you see. But there's sometimes in our life we don't need a two plus two equals four. We need five loaves and two fishes can feed 5,000 instead of one person. We gotta have a miracle. We gotta have a God equation that's here. And you get your back against the wall and you're wondering what you're gonna do and how am I gonna get through this? And the doctor said, I've done all I can do. But then somebody walks in the room that's been alone with God and the hidden mystery and the deep things and they said, I've got a word from the Lord. The Lord said, you're gonna live and not die. And you cling to this knowing all of the facts and all of the scans and all the reports say you're not going to make it. But then you've got this voice over here that's been alone with the one that declares the end from the beginning. And you hold on to the word of God and the miracle takes place. And the doctor says, I can't explain it. What is it? Somebody's been alone with God. My happiest days have been when I was alone with the Lord. My greatest days days have been when I have walked out of an altar deep things of God and I'm preaching to you there's things God wants to reveal God wants to show you God wants you to see but you can't get that with five hours of of Hollywood you can't get that with five hours of the news you can't get that with all of these voices in your house and you can't get that sometimes you gotta just push it back season maybe not forever but push it back for a season and say I'm going to get alone with the Lord until I hear what God is saying wasn't too long ago I had to work through a situation it took me days and days and days of prayer but God gave me a word from the Lord I had a word from God there's nothing like having something from God It's it's a hidden mystery it's a hidden wisdom doesn't make sense logically but somehow you walk in the peace of God knowing it's going to be alright that's why we say we're going to pray about it hold on a minute let's pray about it what are we doing I'm going to get alone with God and I'm going to get what I'm going to find some hidden wisdom I'm going to get alone with God and get some deep things and all of a sudden that what was not visible 
becomes visible. The Bible says we see him who is invisible. We love him in whom we have not seen. What makes y'all come to church on a Wednesday night? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's love. Somebody shout love. The gifts of the Spirit, when somebody lays hands on you and they prophesy, or they lay hands on you and you're healed, or they operate in the gifts of helps, the gift of wisdom, the gift of knowledge, the gifts of the Spirit, all of that is because of one thing, charity. It's love. Every gift of the Spirit operates from one foundation. It's called love. Everybody say love. Suffers long as patient is kind. Doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. You can read that. A lot of weddings, they read it. It's talking about the love nature of God. You cannot have that love because you're just born a human. That love does not come from man. It comes from being alone with God. And out of that love, when you truly love people, I'll give you an example, then we're going to pray. I'll never forget one of my friends, Court Chavis, was praying. He said, Aaron, he said, I, there was a lady in front of me who was at a conference. The Spirit of the Lord was moving in that moment. Faith rises. You ever go to church and doesn't, you don't feel powerful, but then after the praise and worship, and the atmosphere begins, like Sunday night was electrifying, wasn't it? Believe God for anything. And uh, atmosphere is right. Why? The movement of the Spirit starts revealing the hidden things of God. Don't take it for granted that's emotionalism. It's the movement of the Spirit. And all of a sudden, people, the faith comes. Faith enters. You start believing for anything. You believe cripples can be healed. People can get out of wheelchairs. And when that happens, you start seeing what God wants you to see. He starts pulling back the curtain and saying, here's what I'm going to do tonight. And the church says what? Amen. Somebody shout it. People get out of wheelchairs and blinded eyes are open. That's the job of the preacher is to get you to a place of hunger that you can see and then God begins to let you see what's invisible. He said, I was in a meeting. He said, faith had hit, went through the roof. He said, there was a person in front of me that I went down and prayed and they told me that she was deaf. He said, I laid hands on her ears. He said, and I just pictured her being my daughter that could not hear. But the Nehemiah, he said, when I pictured her as my daughter, I felt this love come over me. And when I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed, she was instantly healed. They exchanged numbers, come to find out that this girl had been born without an ear canal. None of that was there. But God put one in there in that moment because God's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. you got to start seeing what God wants you to see. And I wonder, I wonder in this room tonight, what's been behind the curtain in your life? That's right behind, that it's so close to you, but just church is methodical, just church is a routine. It's just a religious thing you do, but God hasn't appeared. You're, you've been walking on the road to Emmaus and somebody's walking with it, but it hasn't appeared yet. You hear the voice? I come to tell you, I believe God's going to turn around and say, let me let you see me. He walked on the earth for 40 days, but there was a selected few that got to see his resurrected self. Do you understand that? Do you believe that? Why? Because they didn't believe. I believe in this room right now, and in time, we believe God wants to appear among us. Amen. How many believe there's angels in the building? How many believe the Spirit of the Lord is here right now? Would you clap your hands and thank him? I want you to lift your hands and ask God to speak to you. The hidden things of God. He revealeth his secrets to the prophets. I'm going to get along with the Lord and let him speak to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, reveal to me. Reveal to me, oh God. Let me see what you want me to see.
God, show me what you're going to do with my lost family member. Show me what you can do. I want to see what you see. I want to know what you know. The hidden mystery, the hidden wisdom of God. Reveal to me, God, the truths of your spirit. As you're watching online, I want you to pray. Let me see, God, the truth. Let me see the revelation of the truth. I mean, want this, what I'm talking about. Everybody say deep things of God. Sometimes all it takes is a day of fasting and an hour of prayer. And you get right back into it. How many ever been concerned that you've lost your desire? Did you raise your hand? Just lost your desire. What do you do? I'm going to tell you what to do. Quit feeding your flesh. You're not demonic. You're just flesh carnal. Just quit feeding your flesh. Push the food back. Caffeine, candy bars, media. Get up before you want to. Get on your knees and start praying. You know what I do when in those moments I pray louder than I think? Look at your neighbor and say, pray louder than you think. How long should you pray? Pray till you want to. Right? Let me give you this story then I'll let you go tonight. Nick Mahaney is an evangelist in the, in the United Pentecostal Church. He is dad was Charles Mahaney. How many of you have ever heard of Charles Mahaney? Evangelist. He was a camp meeting preacher. He was a uh, um, powerful man of God and God had saved him from an alcoholic lifestyle and, and uh, jail and life of sin and drugs or whatever. But he was a powerful preacher and he's gone to be with the Lord now but his son Nick Mahaney uh, is now evangelizing. Nick Mahaney when he was in his early 20s, he, he lived the life of rough sin. His son had backslid and went away from God and did everything you imagine, he told me. He said, he showed me a picture. He said, that was me right there. He said, right after that, he said, I was homeless because of my addiction. He said, it was so cold one night, I was just shivering. I didn't have anywhere to go. I was just trembling. How many ever been cold and trembling? He said, I broke into an abandoned house and crawled in this abandoned house. Nobody in the world knew where I was. I was trembling. He said, all of a sudden, in the midst of the trembling, I felt warmness come over me. He said, I'm an outdoorsman. I know what that means. When you're trembling, you get warmness come all over you. The temperature hadn't changed. That means you're dying. He said, I knew I was dying. He said, I'm there and my body became warm and I'm dying of hypothermia. It was so cold outside, homeless, a band living this life. He said, all of a sudden, while I was laying there nearly unconscious, I heard a knock on that abandoned door of that house that I was in. And I heard, Nikki? He said, nobody in the world called me Nikki but my dad. He said, Nikki? And he said, he said, all of a sudden, my dad came through and got a hold of me and said, Nick, it's your dad. Come on, you're dying. You're dying, Nick. Come on. He said, he helped me. He said, he put me in that warm truck and took me home. He said, when I started getting my act together, he said, I kept, come here, Brent. He said, I kept doing this. He said, when my dad was picking me up, I would kept doing this because he thought I was hallucinating. Dad, 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 is that really you? He said, I was dying. So he put me in a truck, drove me down the road. He said, finally, when I was able at some point to have some coming to, he said, I said, Dad, how did you know I was dying? Nobody knew where I was at. He said, son, he said, an angel of the Lord shook me while I was asleep tonight in my bed. Shook me. And said, get up, your son's dying. And said, he held out an address and said, that's where he is. And he went to an abandoned house and found
found his son. He said, I'm not done with him. Tell, he said, and I'm telling you, the Lord said he's not done with him yet. The deep things of God. Come on, do you believe the Lord can do that? God can do that. God can do that. He can hear, he can see. It sounds like Acts chapter 10 when the angel came down and said, send for Simon Peter. Amen. He said, Simon said, he's going to tell you what you need to do. I believe tonight that God can move upon us in our dreams. God can move upon us in our vision, but we got to get along with him and say, God, I want what you have for me. I want to be what you want me to be. Lift your hands right now and just say, God, help me find those hidden wisdom. Let me find the deep things of the Spirit.